three people and you're going to have four weeks to do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it worked. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello, I am Sam Fry and welcome to Technique, the podcast where we speak to artists about technology. Usually in these episodes, myself or my co-host Richard Adams interview an artist about their practice. However, today is a little different. This is because today Richard speaks to a series of artists that are all involved in the same exhibition. The exhibition is called Rules of Engagement and it's part of an arts program at the Open Data Institute called Data as Culture. Essentially, the Rules of Engagement exhibition asks us to see people as more than just data points and to reimagine how we might engage with data. Here is Richard introducing the exhibition and the artists that are involved. Firstly, just to introduce that, Rules of Engagement is the exhibition at the ODI. It's curated by guest curator Antonio Roberts who was inspired by numerous scandals involving data towards the end of the 2010s. And Antonio's commissioned three artists, Nick Briz, Everett Pipkin, and A.M. Dark, to produce works for this under the umbrella of the Data as Culture Art Programme at the ODI, which is run by Hannah Redler or Hawes. So today, Richard speaks to a number of people involved in this exhibition, including the ODI's Data as Culture lead, Hannah redler Halls, plus artist Nick Briz. But first, he speaks to the curator of the exhibition, Antonio Roberts. I actually had intended to get Antonio on this podcast about his own work a couple of years ago, and I think it's probably useful to introduce him and his background as an artist first. So here's a little bit of Antonio talking about his practice and some of his artistic interests. So my artistic practice, I've been very interested in copyright and how digital technology overall has impacted the way we share, how we create, and even just who owns things and how we own things. So that's that's been a theme that's been running from my work quite a lot and it manifests itself in the fact that, for example, I only use open source software more as a democratizing, democratizing tool. The ethics behind it, I still somewhat agree with, but that's more just like increasing access to everyone with technology. It's related, but yeah, another side of it, which is the live coding and Algorave side of things. So Algorave is a portmanteau of algorithm and rave. You put them together and you get Algorave. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's based around electronic music and electronic visuals. And yeah, for sure, electronic music has been being made for decades. You know, you've got computers, you've got pattern-based music since forever. So Algorave as a term was coined in 2012 by Addict and Clay and Nick Collins and one of the big things at Algorave is that when we're performing with our laptops writing code that is generating music and generating visuals one of the big things is that we are showing the code being made we're showing our screen so we're projecting that onto a screen behind us so you are seeing the process of the music being made you're seeing it unfold and I guess hearing it unfold and even if you don't necessarily understand the code itself you get that um, response thing, the immediate response of someone typing in drum and then you hear a drum sound being played or you know, typing in circle and then in the visual there's a circle appearing. And in that sense, it demystifies the computer because you know, we're, we're told that, especially now with the whole discourse around AI, that computers are mysterious, they work in weird ways and no one knows what they're doing. Whereas at least at Algorithms, you're seeing that there's still a human here, you know, like computers were made by humans and they're being used by humans. And this is how they're being used. So I've been doing Algorithms now for, well, playing at them for about six years, maybe five, I'm not sure. And it's got a huge online culture. It was, Alex McLean is based in Sheffield. So I guess the home of it is in the north of England, but there's many communities, South America, 
smaller communities in say Australia, there's communities in, in New York, for example, a really big community there. And we're all able to collaborate and share because of the tools that we've been building. But again, going going back a little bit to what I just said before, like you know, the demystifying of how computers work is really at the heart of what we do. Whether that be because we're all building our own tools, many of them open source, showing what we're doing. And by doing it, there is an educational aspect of it as well. Yes, we run lots of workshops, but just, hey, you can get involved with computing and technology. Like it's still like anything, you've got to learn it, but it's not some massively... It's not rocket science. (laughs) Um, Yeah, Yeah, unless you're programming rockets. That was Antonio. And while this exhibition isn't about programming rockets, it does focus on some of the themes that Antonio is interested in in his own work. So from here on in, I'll leave you to the interview, which starts with Richard asking Antonio Roberts about rules of engagement. Antonio, as curator, I'd be interested to hear really what you were trying to do with the exhibition rules of engagement? There's quite a lot I was really trying to think about. So uh, I guess the the, the main thing is just thinking about the lived experience of being affected by data. I was thinking about the scandals that have happened within, well, within my lifetime regarding data and especially the recent ones, biggest one, Cambridge Analytica. And when we're thinking about how it's, the effects of that, we often think about data. We think about how it's affected people in the, bigger sense the grander scheme of things so it's like affecting a country or affecting a city or something but i wanted to think about well who are the actual people who are being affected by leaks of data by data hacking by misuse of data and it's often people who are otherwise marginalized in some way and that could be smaller local communities who are impoverished in whatever way and that often is a story that isn't really talked about or isn't really focused on it's always data, big data, big data sets. Approaching it this way, I started to look for artists whose work really speaks to that because they are like people of the internet. They have lived on the internet and seen these things happen or because they live through this every day and you have wanted to bring those artists together to talk about that. And in particularly because it's at such a big event, the um, ODI Summit, where there are people coming to this event who have more power to change things, who are the policy makers. Do you think and it's political exhibition? No, all art, especially art made these days, is political. Like and certainly any any artwork I think, especially now that is made and talks about technology in some way, whether that be machine learning, artificial intelligence, just by the very nature of the technology you're using, you are engaging in, in politics whether that be uh, overtly or just subconsciously, the work is going to be political. So yeah, by that stretch, this work is political, I feel. (laughs) (laughs) Politics with a big P and politics and political with a small P. Maybe hundreds of people have asked you this, but where do you think it sort of fits then in the sort of history of art? Because obviously there's an awful lot of political art through the centuries and different movements that explicitly attack what's going off if there's a line back through art history whereabouts do you think it's sort of going just really fighting against any structures especially large structures which are oppressive in some way it goes back long before i was born like i'm born in the 80s and this goes back fighting against systems of oppression whether that be again political ones it it fits within that but it's obviously dealing with it in a very current way which is internet and digital technologies yeah i I mean i could draw some i mean i have some pretty direct influences (laughs) from previous art movements too also i just want to echo what what antonio is saying too i think it's definitely political but less in terms of the kind of which party are you on sort of politics Mm. more in the way that issues that i think are defining the time that we're living in and that are you know, affecting groups of people in ways that I think can concern large groups of people. And so it's definitely political. And for me, like my piece and a lot of the work that I do, if it's critical towards any aspect of society, it's definitely those that I think that Antonio was also alluding to, sort of the those producing certain larger systems. It's more kind of an affront on these systems than any one particular party or individual. Specifically, I'm thinking sort of the surveillance capitalist systems the that are sort of underpinning a lot of social media, not all social media, but a lot of social media companies like Facebook, as well as other sort of services and tools we use online, like Google search or anything Google makes, really. 
personally have tried to sort of tackle these issues has drawn a lot of inspiration from movements like the Surrealists um, in late 60s, France. So artists like Guy Debord, people who took the sort of output of certain media systems that they were trying to criticize and then sort of appropriated or, or, or thought about tactical ways of sort of reusing them. And though I don't think the specific ways that those artists engaged with that media, with popular media, I don't know that those those techniques really apply today, but I think the way of thinking really applies today, both in the terms of the situationists and then also in the 80s, there were a lot of like what they called like culture jammer artists that were big influences mm -hmm. on me too. So groups like Negative Land or remix billboards to kind of flip their message. The act of remixing media was like really political, right? Because we were told we're not allowed to use, like this is, this belongs to the musicians or the, or the, you know, movie companies and stuff. And so the act of just taking that and remixing it was, was I think pretty radical. Now in the age of social media, you know, these are the systems that are controlling these messages now invite you to use them, right? They, they call us users. So the idea is we're supposed to use the, the, the systems that they're producing because this is how they generate their wealth and really at the core of their business model. Yeah, I mean, your, your piece, Nick, is called How They Watch You. It'd be interesting to sort of hear you explain what that piece of work actually is. It's essentially a hypermedia essay. So hypermedia meaning nonlinear interactive web-based essay. And it's an essay both in the sense that you're reading. It also has a lot of media components to help explain and articulate what that tracking looks like. So the, the focus is online tracking, sort of one, one aspect of this larger system of surveillance capitalism, specifically the way that your online behavior is sort of tracked and monitored without you necessarily knowing it. The essay kind of breaks down exactly what that looks like, what those different pieces of information are, and very importantly, how that's used, you know, within this larger system. And I've been making work about this for a while now. And earlier on, it was really about just revealing these systems, because I think a lot of folks weren't aware that any of this was happening um, in the sort of earlier days of like Facebook and Google. Now, I think that we generally know that there's some shady practices going on and we know that Facebook is fucked and Google is fucked, but we don't totally understand exactly what that means. We, we know that, they're, that they've got like, quote unquote, our data, but specifically what kind of data, what does that look like? How are they recording it? And more so what I've noticed that people have a hard time really understanding is how that's used against them. There was a lot of folks that would say, like, I don't care that I'm being recorded. I have nothing to hide, like this sort of sentiment. And, and anytime I heard people say that, what I really heard was I don't fully understand the implications of giving them my data, like really how it comes back and haunts me in the end. So at the focus of the, of the essay is this idea of um, online fingerprinting, which is just one of the techniques for tracking your behavior and your activity online. Shortly before fingerprinting became more ubiquitous, the sort of kind of dominant trick was these third-party cookies where they leave these sort of cookies mm -hmm. on your browser. And then as you visit other sites, the ad network sort of embedded in those sites can see that you are you, essentially. Um, I think that folks, especially in Europe, I think are more aware of cookies now. There's legislation around, you know, making, making the use of these more transparent. And then the technology is sort of evolving to to no longer use those. And so that's where we see stuff like browser fingerprinting taking its place because that exists outside of some of that, some of those tools and legislations and whatnot. And if at some point we get to a place culturally with fingerprinting that we have with cookies, which is to say that we sort of generally start to understand it a little better and put certain safeguards, whether those are legislative or technical safeguards in place, likely some other technology will take its place. And I allude to some of those, demonstrate some of those like key logging and such and recording in, in the essay. So the idea is that there's this bigger sort of system or this bigger, this larger momentum, which is kind of surveillance capitalist incentive, this desire to monetize our online experiences. And though the particular means or methods for doing that might change, that larger thing is still sort of going on. So that's what I meant by the sort of beyond. So mm. I give some concrete examples so that we can understand it and really see it like fingerprinting, but I want folks not to lose sight of the fact that this is just one piece of the larger situation. How are people reacting to the work? Well, it's just launched a few days ago, but from the people that we've shown it to and, and observed interacting with it, they've actually been astonished 
They've been really, really, even people who are quite, you know, sort of regular tech users, obviously not the people who are coders who we're also showing it to being through Open Data Institute, but people find it really, really surprising the way it, Nick's process of taking you through a sort of slow unraveling of your own mm. expectations of your machine is surprising. And it's also done in a really funny way. So there's a dialogue, it's an interactive dialogue with Nick where he anticipates what you might say. And what you might say is quite tongue in cheek. But it kind of powers you at the end. Um, I don't want to give the game away. I want people to sort of get the big reveal at the end. But it powers you in a way that just makes you aware that even if you think you understand it all from the top level chatter that goes around around this sort of surveillance technologies, it, it's quite overwhelming at the end but in a very managed way. And the essay also directs you to places where you can find out more and work out you know, how you can act upon the information that you've been able to reveal. And I think that's one of the very humane and lovely aspects of this piece of work. Definitely, yeah, I've been watching the, the reactions online. And one reaction I saw was, this is just enacting the same things that Nick is talking about. It's collecting my data. And yeah, someone had a question about that. But this work doesn't use any server-side technology, and that means that it isn't collecting your data. So when it's tracking you in all of these different ways, the work itself, it's doing that with just like the bare basic of internet technologies, which to me reveals that these methods that they're using are embedded within our everyday usage of the internet. It doesn't require, almost, it requires you to do nothing. <laughs> it doesn't require you to say, I accept the cookies, or it doesn't require you to install a browser add-on or anything and that was scary, <laughs> you know, yeah. but not in, in an educational way, in a revealing way, not in, in a negative way. And so um, at least from the reactions I've seen is that a massive reveal, really. <laughs> You said you, know, you feel the work's quite humane and all of this sort of stuff and people have laughed and responded. A lot of computer digital art doesn't hit people in the stomach and make them go, oh, you know, it looks fantastic, it's clever. This in particular is a piece where I think it really is pushing you to feel yeah, it works with your assumptions and expectations mm. and you don't feel foolish, you feel enlightened. There's quite a lot of emotion in it because there's a kindness to it, actually, to this piece of work. I think that's mm. something very powerful as well as a deep critical edge. There's a kindness and there's a design to the user experience that's informed by quite a deep observation of the ways people behave in these contexts, I would say. That's my observation to Nick, you know, just responding to a piece of work mm. I've only seen finally for a few days. And even on the, on the kindness side of things as well, like what I like about this work is that Nick could have done terrible things like, you know, I'm going to shock you into seeing how much data I've collected <laughs> by logging into all of your websites and stealing all of your money. Or, you know, it, the reveal could have been anything where it seems like it's hacking you or any way, but just taking you through, holding your hand and showing you. And then it's like it's giving you a hug at the end and saying... We a lot of work, didn't we, Antonio? As part of this process, one of the really, really difficult aspects of this entire brief is coming from the Open Data Institute that is a champion of best practice. We couldn't really facilitate any project that appeared to cause harm or that appeared to mm. be working with people's data in an unethical way. And we looked around at a lot of benchmarked projects and we did find quite a lot of what you might call quite cruel artworks that enact a reveal that's actually hugely exposing. But some of those are are funny and you can sort of see the light side, but some of them are kind of on the edge and a little bit dark. The, the technical culture we're in, and it's enabling nastiness. My own work is partly having a go at selfie culture, precisely for this point, because I, there I am, sat in hospital, just coming around from dying, and you know I'm looking at people having a great time and sort of promoting themselves, and you feel sick. See, whereas work like this is saying, when you put into these systems, you've got all of this stuff happening, you know, and it does this reveal, and like you say, there's a sense of relief, there's, there's laughing, and and you know it's really good to see that positive side. That's something I'm especially with this piece, very proactively striving towards. Definitely been on that darker side of the line before too. Like I said, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time. Yeah. So as an example, I did a piece 
I mean, like 10 or so years ago called a charge for privacy. And this was in that era where I was saying that people still had no idea what the exchange was, right? They just thought that these were free services. And so my goal was trying to help people understand that none of this was free. They're exchanging data for these services. And so I made this cell phone charging station where in the gallery, you could plug your phone in to have it charge your phone. Because this was during uh, Miami Art Basel and there's a lot of like foot traffic and people are looking for places to charge their phone. So I made this installation that allowed them to do that. But what would happen is when you would plug it in, the screen would say that um, your phone was detected and it was charging and that all your photos were being downloaded and that they were gonna be projected in the gallery. And so everybody who charged their phones had all their all their photos downloaded into the installation and then projected elsewhere. I would glitch the photos before projecting them and blur them a bit because of this question of like, yeah. where is the line? But ultimately, I think a lot of artists that work that way, that are on this other sort of side of this divide that we're drawing out, that they're trying to kind of shock people into paying attention, especially again, like 10 years ago, there was this frustration from those of us that were working in this area that nobody was paying attention and it was pivotal that they paid attention. And so one technique was like, well, if we just scare them, <laughs> maybe they'll pay more <laughs> attention. It's a technique that I've like felt really conflicted about over the years. And so, and for, for the reasons that we sort of, you know, that we're sort of alluding to here and why more and more I've tried to figure out if there's a kinder way. Antonio, we haven't talked about the, the two other works in the exhibition yet. I wonder if you could give us a quick overview of those. Sure thing. So I'll just mention firstly of Everest Pipkin's commission, Shell Song. Everest Pipkin's work is an interactive audio narrative game and it's exploring concepts of deep fake voice technologies. You begin to learn about their experience with their own voice and also hearing their own voice being used within, say, data sets that are being used to generate deep fake voices. Firstly, if you don't know what deep fake voices are, just like you've got deep fake videos, it's you know mm-hmm. gathering enough data about a person to imitate them in a video, or and in this sense, it's being used to imitate a voice. And yeah, so through this narrative game, they take you through their own experiences of face blindness and recognizing people by voices, and then talking about how they would lend their own voice to a data set called LibreVox, which you can basically read stories for like audio recordings. You could record your voice reading a book for audio books, for open source, freely available audio books. And they would do this, but then eventually that same data set, because it was Creative Commons license, was being used to train these AIs, which were synthesizing voices. And it's a commercial operation. So if you want to go and do this yourself, you can go to the website, read several passages of text and have it imitate your own voice. And that kind of spookiness, really, of knowing that your voice will outlast you, that it will live on forever in this synthesized voice. When you're, as you're going through the work, there's a narrative bit of text appearing on screen, but at the same time, you're hearing this voice reading it, which is a synthesized version of Everest's voice. And yeah, it's it's just kind of spooky to hear how the computer is processing it. It's, it's a about 30 to 40 minute game. Mm. And as you go through it, they speak about so many other things as well, about how trying to replicate speech through mimicking different body and muscle movements and why people would want to do that. And yeah, it's a beautiful piece of work. <laughs> the thing that really interests me in this piece is actually the, the notion of outliving you. And that's interesting back to the data, the stuff that, that Nick talks about. The fact that once you're on Facebook, you've got a profile. There's a whole death industry on Facebook dealing with dead people's profiles that are still there. I love the idea that you're playing a game and the voice lives on beyond that. And I really like this work because it's not like it's, you know, I guess making a point that your data is being collected and you should be afraid, but it's <laughs> definitely dealing with the, you know, the, the real world implications of encountering your own voice, knowing that your data is out there and the thoughts and emotions that go along with that. So I guess if I compare it to Nick's work where like there's a, this is what the companies are doing, like I, I, no, I don't think really the point is made so much in uh, Everest work where it's like these are the the companies are using your data in this way and manipulating it and phoning up your bank to say hey give me some money that using your own voice they're not doing that and I don't think that the work makes that point but it still is 
this is your data, this is you, this is your representations of you, your body, mm. everything that you're doing. And it's being used in these ways. And it's just you know, that, that encounter with that voice. What about the other work by AM Dark? AM Dark didn't actually have any work launching at the summit. And instead, mm-hmm. they're doing an artist in residence with ODI, uh, where they're going to produce some work. At the summit, we had a conversation about around the, their residency and the themes that they want to discuss around that. So they're basically trying to expose bias in algorithms because in the discourse around AI, there's a certain perception that AI is truth. With enough data sets, you can get to an objective truth about whatever it is. The example they use, you know, giving someone um, credit rating, saying whether or not they're going to get a job, you know, use AI and it will all tell you the truth about yourself, another person, society at large, or the universe, whatever. But what AM wants to expose, or say expose, reveal in their residency, and they do so in their work, wider work as well, is that AI is biased. It is imbued with the biases and thoughts with the programmers and also the data that's collected. But they want to do that, especially like when you consider the power imbalances between and the social differences between those who are programming the works and who are collecting the data sets and also and then the people whose data is being used. Silicon Valley workers, typically white males. These these algorithms which they're producing are making these snap judgments, like you put your data into the, the form or you have the camera look at you and within seconds it tells you, you are this, you don't get this, you do get this. So one thing that they were talking about in their residency and in their work, what they're sort of proposing to do or one of the things I want to do is build their own algorithm um, but be totally transparent about their own biases like you know they're they're a person of color living in the west coast of uh, America and they have a life experience of being encountered by police of being perceived different way by Mm. say like they've worked in gaming and being perceived by gamers typically white gamers in that world and so build an algorithm which is going to make these snap judgments about people but be transparent about that process to show that your algorithm as well programmer generic programmer there is also making those snap judgments you just aren't (laughs) i guess being honest with yourself that you're doing this whereas am is being honest about that to again reveal that this is what algorithms are doing Can you talk a little bit about how they actually do that act of reveal? We're using the word reveal quite a lot yeah, because actually, we are. which is interesting in itself, yeah. isn't it? That so much seems to be hidden. So again, they haven't built this yet, but you know, they wanted to do it by say comparing you look like a person who does this or you look like a person who works at a company that enables white supremacy. You look like a person who's going to judge someone just because of the color of their skin and taking on these social character constructs and saying, based on whatever they decide to say, you look like this person. One of the ongoing conversations between AM, Antonio, us and the ODI teams are how can you create something like this that confronts the existing unethical structures with an equally unethical structure that is transparently so? But how can you do that without being unethical? And we've had a lot of really interesting conversations, um, and that's part of the residency. And one of our favourite moments, which is kind of awful and brilliant all at the same time, speaking to a lawyer who said, you know, we said, well, can we do this? Well, that would be tricky because, well, can we do this? Well, that would be tricky because. And we were like, yeah, what's the difference? And he said, well, to be honest, sometimes being challenging is harder than being illegal because it's all around the perception. And so how perception is wrapped into this is really, really interesting that you can tell the truth, but if it's perceived to be defamation rather than the truth, you're in trouble. How do you think as curators and as an artist, Nick, how do we keep these works beyond their particular exhibition lifespan? Because obviously with a painting, you've got it for a thousand years. It's a physical object and it's made of oil and canvas. 
But how do you think curating beyond the exhibition? And how do we keep the learnings out there? Have you given any thought to that? I've given a lot of thought. <laughs> so I also teach a lot with my students, like how, what are all the details that you need to consider in order to ensure that your work can live on? But could we actually before just mm. jumping back into the the ethics, because this is definitely one of the threads I think that connects all the works in the show in a really yeah. interesting way. And it's actually some of my favorite aspects of it. Also considering that the audience, you mentioned, you know, a lot of other artists that have listened to this, the question of how to engage with these technologies ethically is such a tricky but important one. Like how do you avoid perpetuating the same wrongs that you're trying to criticize when you're using these technologies? Before we're talking about this idea of, of being true to the medium, right? And actually using the technology to, mm. to, to produce the work itself. But that's where that we open that dangerous door of further feeding the systems that we're trying to address. But I think that it can be done. The devil's just in the in the details. So take, for example, the example of AI that's used to classify images or generate images like the type that AM is, is talking about addressing in, in their work. Um, there are so many different ways artists can engage with this new technology, right? And we can engage with it at, at various levels. And what's interesting about these various levels of engagement is that they also present the various different forms of bias that present themselves in, in these systems that, that we're sort of addressing. So say, for example, to, to create one of these image classifications and or generative AI systems, you first need a lot of data, right? You need to gather a bunch of data say, labeled images of whatever it is you're trying to classify or generate. Mm. And that's the first place where bias enters the picture, who is represented in that data set, which then gets used to train this model. And the next step is you need a neural network or some sort of algorithmic structure that is going to learn from that data to generate the model. And there's another question there of who generated that system, that neural network? Was that, did that come from a university context with certain interests or from a corporate context with other sort of priorities and interests? And bias enters the picture again there. And then there's what we call the algorithmic bias or machine bias, which is what we were discussing a moment ago, which is people's blind faith in the algorithms. Yeah. Once it's trained and it's out there, um, we tend to think that somehow this is neutral <laughs> and that faith that we put in, in the system is, yeah, is problematic. And that, that's also a point where artists can enter in because an artist wanting to make work with machine learning with, with these sorts of algorithms can do so by using these high level APIs, by using... Uh, algorithms that are already pre-trained and made available to them through systems like IBM Watson or something like that. Or they can go very down to the depths and gather their own data sets and create their own algorithms. And I think those the ethical ri risks of whether or not we're perpetuating some of these issues depends on how you enter into those spaces. So say, for example, if you're using IBM Watson to make a piece of art with their API, you might also be, in that case, feeding back into the system that's perpetuating these, these, these harms, these issues. But if you were to gather your own data set and produce almost like a FOI neural network to make a certain point or to make a case, I would argue that in that situation, you're doing more good than, than bad, right? Because you're not actually feeding back into the system that's, say, for example, being used by cops and law enforcement. Your, your neural network only exists in the context of this piece, for example. Yeah, AM, what they have been talking about so far, what they've been yeah. proposing, is what Nick is saying, where they are going and gathering their own data. Again, revealing that they are yeah. completely biased in the data they're collecting, because it's reflecting their own biases, and building it so it is like self-contained. And even then, okay, it's still perpetuating perhaps the idea that AI can be used, but at least in the way that they're using it doesn't have such wider implications as, say, the, the, the AI that cops are using, like in engaging with AM's work, you're not going to get shot. You're not going to get put in jail or whatever because of who you look like. It's still that sort of handholding, taking you through it rather than like, okay, you've accidentally fed into an AI, which would event, which could eventually put someone in jail or have someone killed. So yeah, in that sense, the data ethics side of things is still at the heart of AM's work. It's 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 not a shock just to to make you shock and is a shock reveal to to help and educate you and especially as I said earlier to those people at ODI who have the power to make change to enforce change. Do you think it's very difficult for artists who haven't worked extensively with computers to start down this route? There's a lot of different avenues, a lot of different entry points for artists to enter into this sort of work. And that, that actually brings up a good point about learning this from a perspective of like getting into it mm. deeply, sort of building your own tools instead of using the tools that exist. 
it's also not so black and white, this field. It's, it's not, a, it's, the options aren't either use the thing that IBM and Google made or make it yourself. There's a lot of gray between those two points. And this is one of my favorite things about Everest's piece, actually. In talking about these voice neural networks, they really kind of paint the picture of, of what these different entry points kind of look like, whether it's this open source system where people can volunteer their voices for audiobooks and it's this more community space, but then also really goes through various different corporate contexts and the various ethical issues that some of them share, but then th that are unique to some and not to others. So the ethics are very blurry and likewise the, and the technical entry points are too. And so what I sort of suggest or advise to any artist getting into it is that regardless of whether they're getting into it real deep and writing things from scratch or coming in from the top and using an application or anywhere in between, is that you can still ask those, that those ethical questions are, are relevant at each, at each sort of step. There we go. That's the interview. I'd like to thank Antonia Roberts, Nick Briz, and Hannah Redler-Hawes for featuring in this episode. If you'd like to find out more about their work, the ODI, or the Rules of Engagement exhibition, here's how. Starting with the work of Nick Briz. The URL for the piece is also the, the name of the piece. So the piece is called How They Watch You, and the URL is howthey.watch slash you. Thank you, uh, Antonio. You can find out more about me um, at my website, which is hellocatfood.com. And Hannah, are there any, um, any, any URLs you wish to share about the ODI? Yes, so you can find out about the Rules of Engagement exhibition on the Data as Culture website if you go to culture.vodi.org forward slash on hyphen now forward slash. Thanks again for listening to today's podcast. We hope you like the format. This is actually the first of two episodes like this, as in the next episode, we will be returning to the ODI to speak to a different set of artists about another exhibition. So please look out for that next month. In the meantime, if you did enjoy this episode, please take a moment to give us a five star rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Technique UK and on Instagram at Technique Podcast. If you are listening to this as it comes out, you'll know that it's now December 2020 and it's been a pretty tough year for a lot of people. So I would like to wish you a relaxing end of the year and let's hope, fingers crossed, that 2021 will be better. We will be back again next month with another episode. But until then, take very good care of yourself. Goodbye.